You're in the place where mysteries and the missing meet. Where conspiracies lurk around every corner. Welcome to the Deep Dark Truth. Welcome back to the Deep Dark Truth. I'm Mo. I'm Chip. And I'm Mikey. And today starts our two-part series on the Romanov curse and Rasputin. Spoilers, Rasputin is the Romanov curse. (laughs) You've all seen the movie. You know. Also, this might not be two-part. There might be future bits because chaos. But for now, we're starting with two bits. So mostly this episode is going to focus on the Romanovs and Rasputin's relationship with them. And then later, Chip will discuss the death of Rasputin. These were recorded out of order because I've been sick. My voice is pretty much back. Hopefully it doesn't fail me halfway through with all the talking. So there are some things that might be repeated. There are other things that you'll be like, but you didn't know about that before. And you're right, I didn't. It's very confusing. (laughs) (laughs) I will try my best to clean it up in post. That's future most problem. So the events we're going to be talking about today started in the early 1900s during the reign of Tsar Nicholas II and his wife, Tsarina Alexandra. Tsar Nicholas's reign from the very beginning didn't start off very well. In fact, at his coronation, over 1,400 people died when a mob formed. Oh, no. And this mob formed because food and drinks started running low. Everyone in the crowd was told that, and the crowd as one pushed forward and stampeded people to death. How classic. How very Black Friday. There are various different things within the Romanoff line in previous years that started the rumor of the so-and-so Romanoff curse. A lot of them focus on Rasputin and Rasputin's prophecy regarding the downfall of the Romanovs. But first, we are going to start with just a brief overview of the family and the ages that the children specifically were when they died. Sarina Alexandra and Sar Nicholas had four girls. They were known as the big pair and the little pair. So the big pair, the older two girls, Olga, who was 22 at the time of her death, and Tatiana, who was 21. Olga being the oldest, her godmother was actually Queen Victoria, who was her great grandmother. So you start to see these royal ties, like all Incest. royal families in Europe at the time. Uh, very incestuous, and that led to another thing that is referred to as the Romanov curse. There's lots of curses, lots of things that <laughs> is called the Romanov curse. Let's keep count. One. <laughs> which is the royal curse of hemophilia or being a hemophiliac, which we'll touch on That's just in genetics. a little bit. That's not a curse. <laughs> It is, but it's called the royal curse because of all the inbreeding and because it sustained through the lines and kept popping up because so many people were carrying the gene for it, right? Olga was the oldest and Tatiana was the second oldest. She was nicknamed the governess by her siblings. Whenever they wanted something from their parents, they would send Tatiana because she appears to be Alexandra's favorite And it seemed like Tatiana knew how to deal with their mother's moods as one of the two oldest, Olga as well. They really were leaned on heavily for helping raise their younger siblings. Classic older sibling problems. Correct. While we're here, Tatiana was also just as devoted to the teachings of Rasputin as her mother was. The whole family was, but she was particularly devout. The big pair, along with Alexandra, volunteered as nurses for the Red Cross during the war. So they got to experience a lot of like what the outside world was like through that. And by talking to these soldiers and people from the real world that didn't grow up the way that they did, they started to see a lot of what the common people were saying. And it particularly made Olga a lot wiser to the different things that might be happening in the background and how their family was perceived. In fact, later, when Rasputin was murdered, Olga recognized that it probably was the best thing for the family because their association with Rasputin had helped turn the 
rest of, I don't want to say the peasantry, but the rest of the normal citizens against them. It didn't help the matter. It did not. The little pair... Rhea, who was 19 at the time of her death, was very devoted to her father. She was very apologetic for the mischievousness of her younger sister, Anastasia, who, of course, is the one that gets all of the fame. And Anastasia is the youngest of the four daughters. She was 17 at the time of her death, and her name means of the resurrection, which, of course, we'll touch on later. And added to her her legend and mythos, she was both charming and diabolical in nature. So really, after my own heart, liked to play pranks, was very, I don't want to say sinister, because it wasn't that. She knew how to kind of charm people into getting what she wanted, but was kind of methodical about it, but also liked to play tricks, liked to have fun. A lovable scamp. There's many accounts of her getting close to the guards that eventually ended up guarding the family while they were under house arrest. The last and final child of Alexandra and Nicholas is the one son that they had, Alexei. Alexei was 13 at the time of his death. He was the youngest in the family. And he was a hemophiliac. This is important because Alexei's condition is what caused the Romanovs to become intertwined with Rasputin, who claimed to be a mystical healer. Most hemophiliacs died before reaching adulthood. In fact, Alexander's own brother had died as a child. It was colloquially called the royal disease because it was carried within the royal family or the royal curse. There was obviously a lot of intermarrying happening, which we mentioned. And because only men could inherit the throne, Alexei was given the utmost attention over his sisters after his birth. It seemed to change the family dynamics in a way, but the girls didn't seem to be bitter about it. I mean, they were expecting it. Yeah, I think they were both expecting it. And at at this point, because they were so much older, they took on that older sibling role and then took on becoming his caregiver in a lot of ways. At one point, the family got split up. The Tsar and Tsarina were moved to a different town, but Alexei was too sick to be moved and his sisters stayed behind to take care of him. So it doesn't seem that they were very bitter over it. They took it as doing their family duty, but also he was their younger brother and he was so much younger. It's almost like having your own kid, but not. It's one of those very far removed relationships because there was such a big age gap in the siblings concerning Alexei anyway. So that leads us into Alexei's birth, rather, leads us into Rasputin becoming involved with Romanov's. So Rasputin started hanging around the royal family very frequently as he was providing Alexei with these alleged healing salves. Alexei continuing to survive seems to be the only real proof that Alexandra and Nicholas needed to keep him around. He he was going through a particularly bad bout at, at a certain point, and Rasputin entered the picture, started giving him these salves, and he got better, and that was enough for them. Rasputin had what, even by today's standards, seems to be a very inappropriate relationship, if not unregulated relationship with the daughters in the family. He was allowed to be in closed rooms with them. He was allowed to see them in their nightgowns. And Nicholas and Alexandra seemed to not only not have a problem with this because he was like an alleged holy man, a monk, a mystical healer. The way that maybe your parents might have your pastor pray with pray with you or a priest. Right. The, a position of power that they don't inherently view that religious person as sexual in nature, which is surprising considering all of the things that Chip will tell us eventually about Rasputin and his particular religious sect in the next episode. Real quick, just because other people don't know, I know. I know, but what's give us a little two sentence summary of hemophilia. <laughs> hemophilia is mostly an inherited disorder. It impairs your body's ability to make blood clots. So if you get a cut, you can bleed out. Uh, if you are punched, the bruise underneath won't go away necessarily. It can cause bleeding in your joints. It can cause internal bleeding. 
that gets out of control and uh, effectively it can kill you especially at this point in time. Now there's medications and Mm -hmm. different things that you can take for, to help your blood clot. But at this point in time, there was a lot of people having seizures, for example, uh, intense migraines, all of these different things because their blood wasn't clotting correctly. Uh, Mm -hmm. Also uh, bleeding on the brain, which obviously you can imagine all of the various different things that can go wrong from bleeding on your brain. What couldn't go wrong? When rumors start circulating about how inappropriate this relationship between Rasputin and the four daughters is, which appears to be tipped off by a nurse slash governess that was working in the house. I don't know if she told anybody else or if she just brought it up with the Tsar and Tsarina, but they were basically like, yeah, everybody needs to mind their own business. This is our family business. And... He is our, you know, our religious figure. This doesn't concern you at all. (laughs) I know that Anastasia specifically called him Father Grigori, but I don't know if the other girls addressed him as Father Grigori as well. I would assume so, based on context clues about their devotion to him as a religious figure. So if you put that calculation in with the way he calls the Tsar Tsarina Mama and Papa... (laughs) Really, Anastasia's their granddaughter through Rasputin, who's her father. That sounds like a a shit show that we don't have time to decipher. (laughs) Also, because I will not be bringing it up later while we're on the subject right now, there was Rasputin had some type of amulet slash prayer beads slash something with his image on them. And at the time of their death, all of the Romanovs had them after they were found deceased. Interesting. They had them with them. So there was a lot of upheaval within Russia at this time. They're on the cusp of World War One and going into World War One in the beginning years. And the citizens of Russia were impoverished. And the Tsar didn't seem interested in helping his people, at the very least to their understanding. There were a lot of protests against the royal family and but many were blaming Rasputin for being in the ear of Nicholas and Alexandra, that perhaps if Rasputin was removed from this equation, that something might be able to be rectified, or the Tsar would see the error of his ways, etc., etc. So people are blaming Rasputin, and they're ready to rise up and start a revolution. Their children are starving, the royal family is thriving, they have this holy man slash monk slash mystic healer among them. And they're like, things seemed a little bit better before this guy entered the picture. Mind you, everything is better before times of war and everything that leads up to times of war. (laughs) Yes. But they have a point. Nicholas chooses to get rid of his family member. I'm saying family member because I don't remember if it was his cousin or his uncle that was currently leading the armies and he decides that he's going to take his place at the front line go himself like if i want to get this job done i guess i'm gonna have to do it myself because at this point it was like 1.5 million people had died or been injured in the war so he could feel to some extent at least how unimpressed people were how fearful people were and when people are fearful that is when you need to worry. Nicholas is at the front line. Alexandra is back home. And Rasputin is staying with Alexandra. Yeah, yes. All of these rumors start circulating that they be fucking and that Alexandra is actually the one calling the shots while Nicholas is away. And the shots that she's calling aren't from Nicholas or from her own thoughts, opinions, etc. It's from Rasputin whispering in her ear. So the situation goes from bad to worse to the fucking worst (laughs) and it just it just keeps escalating and throughout all of this you would think that they would take signs of these rumors about rasputin of people being angry of these protests and that they would say rumors that are going around that town st petersburg (laughs) (laughs) you you would think have you heard i think there was 
There was a rumor, but it was in St. Petersburg. Allegedly. So, the rumors. St. Petersburg. Picture. You would think they don't have to actually change their relationship with, with Rasputin, but they don't even attempt to hide it, to make him leave the, the palace, have him just come once a week, or have somebody come to get him under the shadow of night. They change absolutely nothing, and they basically continue to flout like this is none of anybody's business which you know not great to do when people are scared and they feel threatened and their families are dying in the war and they're starving royal's not known for having the finger on the pulse as it were very classically i only read this in passing i didn't look into it but i know that there were rumors both that rasputin was saying let's go to peace with germany russian people didn't like that but he was also saying nicholas you should go to the front lines and win this war so the rumors are saying every which way they want to he definitely wants to keep this war up and get people killed or he definitely wants to go to peace with germany to get people killed Yeah, and I think it's definitely the time to point out that there is no evidence that there was ever a sexual relationship between anybody in the household and Rasputin. There's no evidence that Rasputin ever told Nicholas or Alexandra to do anything one way or the other. Like you just said, there's rumors both ways. He was saying to do this and he was saying to do that. You can't really make assumptions. But I do know for a fact that a very certain religious figure by the name Rasputin did advocate for violence against Jewish people. So, yeah. Not saying which side he was on of manipulating the king and queen, czar and Tsarina. So now here's another aspect of the so-called curse. Or rather, another curse. There's like 19 curses of the Romanovs. Remember when I said that? We're at like three or four now. The quote-unquote curse that is depicted in the movie Anastasia, the cartoon Anastasia, which is the idea that Rasputin himself curses the Romanovs. The actuality of that goes back to a prophecy that Rasputin gave, which he gave many prophecies. But the specific one, Tsar Nicholas did not know of It was sent to him by Rasputin, but he didn't read it until after he came back from the war. At this point, Tsar Nicholas is coming back from the war. Well, he's coming back from the front lines. And Rasputin has been murdered. Tsar Nicholas gets a letter that was sent to him where Rasputin's secretary, Aaron (laughs) Semenovich... Super thought you said son of a bitch just quickly. Aaron, the son of a bitch. <laughs> Aaron Simonovich wrote in his memoirs that the letter contained the following prophecy Tsar of the Russian land, when you hear the bells ringing informing you of the death of Grigory, then know if assassins kill me, Russian peasants, my brothers, the Russian Tsar have no one to fear. Stay on your throne and reign. But if your relatives committed the murder, then none of your family, that is children and relatives, will live longer than two years. The Russian people will kill them. Spoilers. Somebody that is going to be talked about discussing the murder of Rasputin that I need to mention for one simple fact very quickly is named Dmitry Pavlovich. And Dmitry Pavlovich was not only a cousin of the Romanovs, was also at one point the number one contender to become betrothed to Olga, the oldest daughter. Oh, didn't know about that. Olga was actually very hesitant to get betrothed to anyone. And because they finally got their son, Nicholas was allowing them to be choosy, even though the family was, you know, behind the scenes, kind of, what about this person? What about this person? She wanted... Something different, something more adventurous, something outside. Grigory Rasputin dies. Nicholas comes back from the front lines where he is held and he is forced to abdicate the throne. He attempts to sign the abdication to his brother because at this point, at this point, Alexei is like 12. So he's worried about one, the hemophilia and him surviving even though it's his own son, he is at this point more concerned about the Romanov dynasty continuing 
than he is for anything else. Like, that is his true number one responsibility. I don't want to be the one to drop a whole country. Yeah, his brother is like, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Like, that's <laughs> cool, but the peasants are have risen up. We're at war. The country's at turmoil. Everybody hates you. Nobody likes you. Go to the garden to eat worms. I'm out. Okay, so that's the big fuck you. I mean, to be fair, I think he feared for his own life, and also he was just smart enough to be like, that's going to be a no. Like, I don't want involved in this. I'm not the oldest brother. Like, you wanted this so bad. You've been telling all these people to fuck off for this long and not to concern themselves in your business. Well, I don't want to concern myself in your business either. Thanks for coming. Have a nice day. It's going to be a no from me. I am a rat jumping the ship because I should. So now there is no Sar. The throne has been abdicated. Again, women can't inherit. So none of the daughters are really a threat at this point. Even if Alexi would have been a threat, his father had already given, abdicated and given up the throne. So he has no legal claim to it. Things are starting to get dicey. They're really picking up. I think we're in the dicey. It's not starting. We've been diced. Their personal uh, safety is getting really dicey because before they have their their big palace, they have all their walls. Nicholas has power, even though there's uprisings happening. We got a wall between us and them. Yeah, there's still the the power dynamic at play to where they're still safe. Say goodbye to that. But say goodbye to that. Nicholas recognizes this is not looking good. And right in here is the time where the family gets split up for a little bit because Alexi is too sick to move. But eventually they move the whole family out of the palace to a a separate house that is set up for them to be under house arrest. That's why you're looking up that. When you say house arrest, like ordered house arrest or like... Like guarded house arrest. Like guarded by the enemies. Vladimir Lenin has guards stationed at this house so that they cannot leave this house. They have a staff of like four ish people that are just there to to keep them calm. That's really what it is. They give them a staff to keep them calm so that their needs are being met to th- you know, the best of the ability, not quite what it was before when they were in the palace, but just enough of like that privilege. I have a staff. I'm being taken care of life yeah. to where they don't panic. Vladimir Lenin is the one that's ordering the house to be guarded. He was a Russian revolutionary and he was head of the government of Soviet Russia. But at this point, Vladimir Lenin is heading shit. He is the one that has all the power in this particular situation. After being on house arrest for a little while, we're just going to fast forward because they're just living under house arrest. Although there are a few funny stories about a guard like Anastasia was being mischievous and a guard like shot a warning shot at her. And instead of being scared, she like stuck her tongue out and blew a raspberry at him like (laughs) Fuck you, bro. So you can kind of see why she ends up becoming the most exciting, the one that people kind of latched onto in addition to being the youngest girl and what that entails. A few days before the family is killed, they're told that a kitchen boy that was part of their staff had been sent to go stay with his relatives. A kitchen boy, you say? Is he going to open a hole in the wall? Exactly. So that's the reason I mentioned this. Uh, he was about the same age as Alexi. They were kind of playmates, even though he was he was working in the kitchen. He obviously became the inspiration for Dimitri and Anastasia. There's also a book. What's it called? A Tale of a Kitchen Boy. That's a decent book that's supposed to be about the fall of the Romanovs from the perspective of the kitchen boy, et cetera, et cetera. In reality... They sent this boy home because they didn't want to kill the boy because a few days later, July 17th, 1918, 
The family is then sent into the cellar. They're told that there is this uprising, that there's a protest happening. Your personal safety is at risk. We just want to protect you. We're going to have you go to the cellar. They go to the cellar. A few minutes later, somebody comes down and starts reading the writ of their execution orders. The kids and the parents and all of their staff that are left. So the boy is gone. There's four remaining staff that are with them. Yeah, I want to know who looked out for the kid. So the guards sent them home. And actually, there had been a few different times where when they were first sent there, they actually changed out the guards because the guards liked liked the family. They became (laughs) like friendly with the family. And knowing that they were going to end up having these guards kill the families. Doing a shoot. Don't want that. Exactly. They they switched out the guards. So I don't know how frequently it happened. I just know that it was an issue at the beginning and they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> we're realizing we're going to have to eventually kill them. We need someone who isn't charmed by Anastasia. Exactly. And make sure that it's a lot more impersonal. And not let them get as close. So they rectified a mistake that they feel like they had kind of previously made. Oh, I'm just surprised that they cared about this kitchen boy. This nobody. That's so rare for anyone. It is surprising that the daughters had to die because they would have had no claim to the throne anyway. You have this peasant boy that's just a kid that has absolutely no significance. And I think that they knew they could get away with sending him home. Like, I think there was probably already a crisis of conscience happening, but they were like, I don't know how to get out of these, but I know I can get this kid out of this one. Yeah. (laughs) It's just a much easier situation. Yeah, it's just surprising. I agree with it. This is the right choice. (laughs) That kid's got nothing to do with this. So wait a second. Let's back up. They come out of the cellar. They're not walking out of that cellar. They do not walk out of that cellar. So this is from the Russian government, basically, at the time. And orders an execution on just the family, not the guards. and Not the, the guards, but all of the servants. Yeah. So the four household staff and all the kids and the parents. Why? But why the servants? Because they know too much. Because this is what happens. So they kill the Tsar and Tsarina first. There is a lot of smoke and upheaval. There's a lot of firing happening. People have to reload. So there is like these moments of intense panic and screaming and shock and horror that happen in between. Multiple shots coming from multiple angles where nobody can see. So there's some degree of overkill happening. The entire family lies in the cellar dead. They are then taken out of the cellar taken into the woods and are burned, burned with both like fire, but also with acid to try and get rid as quickly as possible as they can with of these bodies. Lenin and different people in the government didn't want people to know that like they had just slaughtered this entire family because they felt that was too much to tell everybody at once. But they do tell them that Nicholas has been killed, but there was too many people there. <laughs> And that that's part of why they killed the servants, because they knew that they didn't want the servants to know anything that happened and that they had killed this whole family because they intended to slowly over time, like Nicholas was killed, but everybody else left and ran off or, oh, we had to shoot them because they were trying to get away or whatever they wanted to say. They knew that it would be bad for them if there were witnesses that weren't directly working for the government. Now that I'm looking up, it's like advisors, like their court physician, their head chef and cook, the lady in waiting. They're people that are embroiled with them and they're loyal to them to some degree, whether that is through years of service or whether that's because they have just been placed under house arrest basically by working with them. They obviously are mostly staying there, too. So they basically just didn't want witnesses is is the long and short of it that they had not only the loyalty was a question, but they wanted to be able to say whatever they wanted. Yeah. And, you know, once these servants went with them, they see the girls as their kids because they've helped raise them. So they basically had a death sentence. So there starts to be questions. Hold on. <laughs> I have a question. Like, yeah, the greater uh, keeping it secret, I guess, makes sense, even though we know they want them dead. I don't don't really get that. But why the shenanigans of, we're going to uh, 
there's an uprising outside, come to the cellar with us. When I was reading about that, I was like, this is so weird, because you're just gonna shoot them. You don't have to lie to them. They're not gonna be able to fight you off. It's just the one I dad. think that they were concerned about the openness of the house, of them trying to get out of the windows, out of the doors, being able to, like, run off in many different directions, and that they wanted them to be in one much smaller space with no other means of exit other than the one that they were blocking, and to do it as quickly as possible. Okay. I can see no other real reason other than that. I don't know if there was also a level of thinking of clean up Mm -hmm. you're not going to want to be going out the front door with dead bodies so cleanup could have been a factor it also just could have been a factor sound even like there's going to be all this shooting going on let's try and get in in a space that isn't obvious that it's coming from the house necessarily yeah it it always just struck me as weird that they were always you know since the last couple weeks when i read about it we're lying to the czar and czarina like oh oh we're protecting you like this is not a charade worth doing they know you're they're under house arrest they know that they are no longer royal and i think they didn't want them to panic and try and get away or panic and start screaming and if they did start screaming they wanted them to be underground in a small ass cellar where not very many people could hear them also, one other thing that you apparently haven't mentioned, just because it's a fun rumor, uh, supposedly, the all the women had the royal jewels sewn into the lining of their uh, everything. Yeah, so when they were originally split up, Nicholas and Alexandra, they had their property seized that they had on them, and they wrote to the girls telling them what happened. And so when the girls went to go meet or meet back together for when they all assumed house arrest together they had sewn things into their dresses that one event made it so that in some cases bullets had bounced off of the jewels and did not kill them at first and that's part of the reason that it took them so long to effectively slaughter this entire family because the girls had jewels tiny bulletproof vests which is just the weirdest thing yeah I'm assuming this is coming from, like, the government, right? Who wanted to execute him on, like... This is the socialist government. Yeah, they they wanted to execute him because if they didn't, there would always be the threat that he would rise back up and assume his place as royalty or one of his descendants would. The idea was to eliminate the threat permanently. The very existence of him... And this family is a problem. as the root cause of their suffering. And the new powers that be are going hard on that and saying, yes, all of your problems were them. It definitely was them. Things are going to be so much better now that other people are assuming. But power. then why hide it? But like, why hide it? They realized that while they wanted to eliminate the threat permanently, that people were not going to think very highly of them slaughtering a 13-year-old and a 17-year-old girl that couldn't inherit anyway. Because they shouldn't have. I understand killing the czar and maybe even the czarina because I'm sure she was in power at some point while he was gone or whatever. They broke laws, I'm sure. That committed crimes against humanity. (laughs) Yeah. Absolutely. 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 But their children did not. Correct. If anything, the oldest two, I think, were really through their Red Cross work brought into humanity in general in a way that they never had been as a kid because they'd been raised so separately. The royal families did matter in their way. So any blood relative in that way, that's such a direct blood relative is a threat. So I get killing them in that sort of way. Obviously, you shouldn't go around killing anyone, even the king, who's an asshole. But yeah, I think one of Olga's other potential ma- matches was a Mountbatten. There is a lot of ties between the royal family and the British royal family. They're all the same family. Yeah, and also what would have potentially been future marriages that would have happened had. All of the Romanovs survived, or at least the children survived, because everyone assumes the other Romanovs were killed or had ran off. That leads to the rumors that possibly some of the children got away. Where are those rumors? And those rumors are in St. Petersburg. The most well-known, obviously, is that people were claiming to then be Anastasia. But- Grandmother. 
It's me. <laughs> yeah. Anastasia was not the only Romanoff imposter of sorts. In fact, there was at least one for every single Romanoff child. Anastasia was just the most charming and mischievous and made for the best, like, media content that was later produced, movies, etc. She was the youngest. She was the one that I feel like people didn't have the most time to get to know. So these Hollywood executives or and writers could then create their own personality for her since people didn't know that much about her in comparison to the older daughters that had been a- around a lot longer. Yeah. So to me, the most intriguing case wasn't somebody pretending to be Anastasia. It was somebody claiming to be Olga, a woman named Marga. And the reason that I think that she's the most interesting is because various cousins of hers that were royalty believed her and they supported her. They supported her until she died. In fact, even Pope Pius XII endorsed her to be Princess Olga. And her headstone identifies her as Princess Olga. Good for her. I have no idea... How she did it. But yeah, kind of good for her, you know? She won the the game. You died being Oga. You know, if you're listening at home, which you are, hi, um, (laughs) don't start believing her. Because many years later, Prince Philip, the Queen's husband, Prince Philip, gives a blood sample to compare his DNA with the DNA of the now discovered Romanov burial site. They knew where it was, but they waited until the fall of the Soviet Union to say where it was because they thought that it would either be desecrated or start another war or cause political upheaval, etc., etc. The reasons that they did this are really endless. Eventually, the Romanov burial site is uncovered, but it has the Tsar and Tsarina and three of the Romanov daughters. And that's it. There's a missing daughter. And Alexei is also missing. But don't think that any of these people were real because eventually in the woods, farther out, they discover the remains of Anastasia and Alexei. Through that DNA of Prince Philip, they are able to then know for certain that these are genetically linked and are therefore the Romanovs. I mean, there's a lot of Roman families that DNA is connected to, so probably not the German royal family. Yeah, it was. there was other cousins that they could have tested, but for whatever reason, Prince Philip, while none of these things are a curse in, in the sense that we see Rasputin curse the Romanovs in the end of the Romanov dynasty in Anastasia, I think that we can... I'll agree that Rasputin's reputation helped further drive a wedge between the royal family and the citizens. And if the Romanovs were cursed, it was a curse of either Rasputin or their own poor ability to sense the will of the people. Yeah, being royal. <laughs> being shitty people. Their apathy, really. They had sequestered themselves to the point where they were so out of touch with what was happening with citizens or just didn't care that it led to their downfall. So when Rasputin is treating Alexei, he is supposedly getting better. And so I just saw a couple theories as to why that might have been. And, you know, therefore that would support why they kept him around. Because if Alexei seemed to be doing better under his care, that's good. Yeah, I mean, there's also times you are just in the middle of a flare-up, right? And hemophilia is is similar. It's a bad day. It has those similar aspects of, yeah, of bad days and flare-ups. It's equally possible that he just would have gotten better with time. Yeah, yeah. And that the, the reaction, the overreaction, is that because of all of this experience of all of these different people throughout history dying from within the family that suffered from hemophilia, that they just assumed that he was going to die when it might not have been as as bad as they thought it was as well. There are two theories. The sort of more calm one is just, so Rasputin said, no more other doctors, go away. And so in being there and thus calming the Tsarina especially, but everyone else, just Alexei had a slightly more stable emotionally like i'm not as constantly stressed as i was Mm -hmm. when all those people were there hovering doctors and hovering opinions multiple opinions this helps them this doesn't 
it could be a shit show, honestly. Yeah, yeah. And I think I I saw this quote, citation needed, that one of the relatives said to Nicholas, like, something like, you gotta get rid of him. And Nicholas said something to the effect of, better, like, ten Rasputins than a, a Alexandra on a bad day. I did mention just briefly, I cannot diagnose people through history, but the way that she's described... <laughs> Is very bits of depression and bits of mania <laughs> and bouts of anger and then bouts of calmness. Mm. It feels a little like bipolar disorder. Cannot obviously in any way diagnose her. But when they mention that Maria knows how to like deal with her mother's moods, moods is a code word. Okay. Yeah. When people don't know what it is. It's called moods. Yeah. Yeah. So Rasputin just being around calming her moods might have simply helped Alexi straight up that way. Yeah. And I don't know if it was intentional because uh, they before bipolar is called bipolar is called manic depression. Before it was manic depression, it was moods. <laughs> and so I don't know if that was intentional in the language as I was reading or if it was just a, a turn of phrase. But I thought that it was very interesting. The way they called the moods. Two, two of the kids look exactly like the mom, and two of the other daughters look exactly like Nicholas. Nicholas. Like, identical almost in the eyes and nose and forehead structure. And then the one daughter is like, doesn't look like either because she's a perfect blend. This is, again, conjecture, but Rasputin, in sending away all the doctors, was also like, none of these medications that they're giving him, all of these are bad, no more. And maybe... The theory is one of those was, I want to say, aspirin. And aspirin could have been aggravating the problem rather than helping it. So simply by getting rid of all the drugs, he happened to get rid of this one that was making everything worse. And so they're like, you're a miracle healer! That's what my thought was. That feels very likely, especially if it was aspirin. Because aspirin was just prescribed for absolutely everything and as we all know aspirin is one not good for you like a regular dose of aspirin versus low dose and also shouldn't really be given to children period let alone children that are suffering from like dehabilitating diseases it's certainly not a thing you should be taking chronically doesn't prolong aspirin in even adults create bleeding in the stomach yeah, ibuprofen as well. So uh, if I was a hemophilic child, that would be like the worst thing for me. It's shocking like, that you're not dead, Alexi. <laughs> it would cause me to have internal bleeding in my stomach that I can't even clot. So I wouldn't be able to eat regularly or digest regularly. And Very interesting. Very interesting theory. <laughs> uh, just to tidy that up, aspirin in a regular person helps prevent the blood from clotting. That would have made any potential little cut on top of the hemophilia 10 times worse it would have made it worse in a regular person NSAIDs are bad for you kids hey, i'm really not a kidding little drug killer drug painkiller oh yeah once in a while but i know a lot of people especially older people i've had patients that have been chronically on NSAIDs and then have stomach bleeding like it's very not good for you <laughs> NSAIDs are my soapbox mix it up so no plot twist. Uh, I opened it with uh, Rasputin was the curse, and uh, I'm closing it with with pretty much similarly. They were their own curse and or their association continually with Rasputin was the curse. And they had a genetic blood curse that was being handed down. Everything was going poorly. Everything. It was, was always going to go poorly. poorly. But join us next time. When Chip talks about the very intriguing circumstances surrounding Rasputin's death. It gets a whole episode. We probably could have done a 12-part series. Till next time, I'm Mo. I'm Chip. And I'm Mikey. Das Vidanya. You just listened to the Deep Dark Truth Podcast. See you next time. And remember, your local cryptids want to meet you. <laughs>